Um, this, I, I saw that just to make a very quick couple of slides just to give you the name of Eva Telyanko because my, my, might be, you might be not uh, familiar with this very important Soviet uh, Marxist thinker uh, who uh, wrote his main work after Second World War and he di uh, died or uh, to be more precise he has taken his life, he committed suicide in the end of 70s. Uh, so, uh, I would like and you just to, to, to see him. Uh, this photo, photograph is taken in Berlin, by the way, in uh, 1945. Um, uh, he was a sort of war veteran, and he's uh, standing here at the ruins of Reichstag. And here is him uh, at 50s. Uh, when he was actually writing this text, I'm going to discuss in my paper. Uh, it's also another nice hipster photograph. Uh, 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 and this is his very old age, uh, it's actually three years be before his suicide, and he's standing here with uh, his uh, uh, another Soviet scholar who influenced his cosmology. Uh, I will tackle this uh, person. Uh, a little bit in my paper. And this is the first page of, uh, I'm sorry, this is Russian, with his autograph. It's a manuscript of this uh, text called Cosmology of Spirit, of the Spirit, uh, uh, which uh, was not published uh, during his lifetime. Uh, uh, it was published 10 years after, after uh, his uh, uh, suicide in uh, uh, 88, I think. Uh, uh, in abridged form, but full text was print, published in early 90s. So this was like, but his other works were, they were published and though he was somehow pressured by some Soviet authorities because his views were original, uh, but still uh, his work was published. It was translated into actually European languages in Italian, uh, English, I think, German, it was translated, but mostly of his um, works of middle, uh, of his middle period of from uh, 60s, 70s, uh, several books. Uh, so I, I'm just, uh, mm, uh, wanted, at least according to my written paper, I wanted to uh, give a short uh, digression uh, because uh, I was just trying to answer the question why I chosen this uh, particular topic. Uh, and for me, this reading this text was uh, connected to the feeling of astonishment of, in a good sense. So in the sense that uh, you're somehow surprised by uh, the thinker who write this uh, sort of text or work. And uh, uh, everybody knows this, uh, Aristotle famously noted in Metaphysics that philosophy begins with, from the feeling of astonishment. Uh, I quote, for through astonishment men have begun to philosophize both in uh, our, uh, our times in, and in the beginning, he says in Metaphysics. Uh, everybody knows this point, it's like a school point, but in, in Greek original Aristotle actually has, uh, has a specific theory of uh, uh, astonishment. Uh, he used the word uh, Tama uh, Zain, which uh, can be translated uh, as astonishment or amazement, uh, uh, and uh, generally uh, means uh, the sort of kind of intellectual shock which somehow forces us to think. Uh, in this sense, uh, those uh, interesting, in in interestingly, he knows that in this sense, those who create myths. Uh, they are also somehow belonging to philosophy in, just in, in terms of astonishment because uh, myths are also based on something wonderful, uh, something astonishing. And this point will play some role in my argument as well. So uh, Aristotle definitely doesn't mean here something naive, uh, sort of idiotic, childish astonishment which uh, somehow is, uh, serves as a so source of philosophical inspiration. Uh, it's uh, rather, he used rather the, the term Greek, Greek word arche, so it means that uh, arche, it's not just something in the very beginning, but something which continue to act uh, throughout the whole history of uh, Philosophy. So uh, Aristotle says that uh, 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 that actually uh, astonishment is arche uh, of uh, philosophical thought. So, uh, but he doesn't indicate what is the source of this uh, centuries-long uh, 
um, continuity of this arche, what, why, how it is maintained, this arche. So uh, I think it could take another <laughs> couple of, uh, uh, another round of discussion to dis uh, for the question of continuity in, uh, of the arche, but still in the very simplest hypothesis would be that uh, uh, the philosophical text itself, uh, which could be inspired by astonishment somehow can be measured and judged by the effect of astonishment it can produce in its reader. So uh, materiality of philosophical te text itself is that uh, which uh, warrants uh, it with durability of astonishment, which can, it can produce in generation if it's classical text. Because Aristotle actually, he doesn't say anything about what is a typically philosophical sources of astonishment or objects of astonishment, though he mentioned, interestingly, self-moving marionettes, which could produce philosophical astonishment, so somehow anticipating sci-fi topic of robots, maybe, I don't know. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, my first claim of this, uh, this paper, if the feeling of uh, astonishment, uh, which uh, can be overwhelming for a reader, would be a criterion for assessing the text, the short uh, treaty or tract called Cosmology of the Spirit by Evel Telienkov would be truly philosophical classics. Uh, uh, as, as I said, Telienkov was, uh, as I said, uh, the, this text uh, was a part of Pastumus' legacy of Elienke. It was never published uh, in his lifetime. Uh, uh, and uh, oh, by the way, now we are editing uh, uh, a, a, an issue of the journal called Stasis, and will be a special issue on Soviet philosophy, and uh, finally will be English translation of this uh, beautiful text. And by uh, lucky occasion, it's translated Giuliano Vivaldi, should be somewhere here in the, in the, in the audience. So, uh, 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 cosmology, what are the main point and why it's so uh, astonishing for at least I tried to rationalize my why I actually did this paper. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, Ilyenkov, uh, uh, I never had any doubt that Evald Ilyenkov was uh, an exemplary representative of the Soviet Marxist philosophy. Of course, it's not dogmatic and uh, creative part. And definitely, uh, was he was outstanding thinking in this context uh, without but however without much theoretical peculiarities or anomalies uh, he was rather creating a bright individual expression of variation uh, or variation or already existing soviet discourse on dialectics historical materialism and so-called activity theory may, you may know that this was a sort of one of uh, original contributions of soviet marxism the elaboration of what they called activity theory which now became a sort of more broad international uh, platform um, involving a lot of people uh, so it's not just Ilyenkov but such people as Vygotsky if you know Lev Vygotsky and other so soviet scholars they were elaborating this theory and Ilyenkov one was somehow uh, amending, developing this paradigm, which considers uh, phenomena of the world of what we are doing as according to the patterns of uh, human labor or activity in a more general term uh, for this, uh, which has its own object, subject, various means of achieving uh, specific goals. So it's like analytics of uh, activity and Lienkov contributed to this a lot. And his main question was about uh, the uh, what uh, shapes the ideal dimension of this activity. So, uh, but uh, so uh, for, for, so for me, it was Irenko for rather this uh, important, however rather standard for this context uh, in terms of his work. But but uh, I think uh, cosmology of the spirit. Uh, this text somehow puts his thought in absolutely fascinating and astonishing perspective. Uh, 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 so, what uh, concerns immediate circumstances for, for writing uh, cosmology, the intellectual historians and memoirists uh, stress the influence uh, of, so cosmology, if I didn't say that cosmology was written in the first half of 50s, after 10 years after Second World War. Uh, uh, what concerns immediate con circumstances for, for writing cosmology, uh, the intellectual historians, uh, they mentioned uh, a self-taught speculative thinker whose name is Pobisk uh, Kuznetsov. Here is, he stands with, together with 
Elianka, but these photographs were made in mid 70s, so like 20 years after the events I'm trying to analyze. So uh, in this, uh, Pobis Kuznetsov uh, was uh, a very interesting figure uh, who uh, was, uh, everything was interesting in him starting from his name, Pobis, which is not a typical Russian name, but it is an acronym for the whole sentence. I will pronounce it in Russian, Pokolenia Oktyabrskih Bartsov i Straitili Komunizma, which means a generation of October Revolution fighter and builders of communism. So his first name is acronym of this um, revolutionary name. So you can imagine how interesting was was other things related to this Kuznetsov. Uh, and uh, he was a sort of universal interdisciplinary scholar who worked or on a wide range of areas, starting from biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, economics even. So uh, he also spent some time in labor camp in late Stalin uh, time uh, for organizing an unsanctioned discussion group for students uh, address the central question uh, at the intersection of evolutionist bio biology and philosophy. What is the function or goal or life uh, at the scale of the universe? Those such questions were discussed. So uh, Ilyenkov uh, uh, convinced uh, Kuznetsov to write uh, an article for Encyclopedia of Philosophy, who, which he was co-editing. Uh, uh, and in Kuznetsov uh, um, wrote this text uh, called Life, uh, Reason, uh, which was published in early 60s in this uh, encyclopedia. And uh, in this text, he considered the f this cos cosmological function of life. Uh, here we are in the common realm with uh, some other speakers who are mentioning this problem. Uh, he considered the function of life as anti-entropic, so bringing higher forms of organization, creating an order from uh, more stochastic, chaotic, uh, field of uh, events, elements, and so on. So uh, as known from physics, entropy is a measure of dispersion of energy. The second law of thermodynamics says that uh, closed system, in closed systems, entropy can only increase. Uh, so this uh, disorder can only increase, which eventually leads to final dispersion of energy and the death of the system. Accordingly, anti-entropic means uh, capacity of some forms of matter, such as uh, biological life, to function as a, to counterbalance the increase of entropy. Uh, and the uh, second point, uh, Kuznetsov also wrote on the problem of so-called thermal death of the universe, so it's entro entropic collapse of the whole world. Uh, it's like cooling down to a degree level, and this was based uh, on the ideas of 19th century physics, and still uh, the second law of thermodynamics is still debated in physics, uh, and it still exists uh, as a sort of paradigm, a scientific paradigm, which could be also leading to such conclusions that uh, the existent universe is, uh, will face its imminent collapse. And, and this point is, was very important for argument of Elyankov as well. Uh, generally, uh, I would say that uh, this discourse on anti-entropic anti functions of life, uh, it was not so unique, and not only this uh, scholar whose name is Kuznetsov was involved into this, but there are were many debates, actually, uh, in 50s and 60s in this, uh, 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 which were related to the question, okay, we, we achieve, will achieve communism, but what then? <laughs> What is, <laughs> what is the meaning of this enterprise? What will be uh, after that? Uh, and what is the f actually function of uh, uh, communism in the whole m m and more broader, uh, more broader uh, perspective? Yeah, actually, uh, actually it's, uh, it, it was qu other words uh, quoting these questions and also m mentioning an anti-entropic function on, of life. And also, uh, if uh, I want to tackle this Russian cosmism question here, but uh, as I'm not specialist in Russian cosmos, I'm just can refer to the secondary reception of this. And it was uh, uh, somehow uh, not allowed in Soviet Union, so Fedorov's work, they were not republished, but uh, still it, they were critically debated. And the most of this progressive uh, intelligentsia in Soviet Union in 1560, they were rather, rather critical uh, to these ideas in the sense that, for example, one of the authors whom I, whom I found, he 
uh, describe this anti-entropic uh, function of life as well, uh, but he rejects uh, somehow the legacy of further of actually finding uh, some elements of uh, sexism in his work, which was quite pro progressive, because actually for him, uh, Fedorov uh, says about resurrection only man, of only men, not women. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, but this Fedorov specialist may correct me and this author, because obviously it's not so simple. But uh, there is a very strong uh, uh, component of this sort of uh, gender-based thinking in Fedorov, uh, for example, or. or Rather verbally, he says that uh, uh, that resurrection concerns only the fathers by sons, and never mentioned, uh, 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 not often or rarely mentioned women function in this. Uh, so, and rather saying that there is a gender division of roles, like men, they are hunting for these elements of uh, relics of the, 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 the previously existing generation, and women, they are somehow making them into new bodies. So also very, <laughs> very interesting. So it was ra rather this sort of critical reception of, uh, uh, of uh, Russian cosmism, in, at least in 60s, before maybe in 70s was different. But in 60s and 50s, they were known, uh, they were cr rather critically assessed by most interesting authors, I would say. Uh, and Ilyenkov definitely shared this rather critical attitude. Uh, however, um, uh, also Ilyenkov do use the scientific uh, 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 topics of thermal death and entropy, which is also common to some of these cosmist uh, thinkers. Uh, uh, but he uses them in combination with elaborated uh, arguments based, based on his treatment of classics of philosophy su such as Spinoza and Hegel. And also uh, the main source of his exp ins ins inspiration is the uh, Friedrich Engels book called uh, Dialectics of Nature. It is actually an unfinished book uh, because uh, Engels was taking too much care about Marx and he was never able to finish this book. Uh, and this is rather a collection of fragments uh, with his natur philosophy, with his uh, philosophy of nature understood uh, from dialectical point of view. Uh, so uh, I will return to this uh, Engels input into this. Uh, so now I would like to uh, summarize quite as briefly as I can, uh, the main argument of cosmology of, spirit, of the spirit uh, and several consequent points. Uh, so the main question of the text is about the function or role of thinking life, it's brackets, it's term for the end of thinking life or thought uh, in the universe, so no more, no less. Uh, <clears throat> the subtitle of the text says that it's an attempt to give a basic outline of objective role of thinking matter uh, in the system of universe, universal interaction, and then in brackets, a philosophical, poetical phantasmagoria based on the principles of dialectical materialism. <laughs> so uh, he uh, somehow, uh, the problem uh, which Lyankov tried to solve in this text stylistically, though the contents of the text are quite radical, he still, try, uh, pl uh, still pledges his adherence to dialectical materialism. He always repeats that, no, it's uh, just dialectical materialism leads us to such conclusion. But you will see uh, what is the argument in this quite specific. Uh, so uh, uh, the central question is the relation between matter and thought in, uh, mm, and the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the universe, uh, the scale of uni universal, un un uh, universe. So, uh, uh, so the text suggests a sort of cosmological hypothesis it's another strategy. One strategy to protect himself or Lyankov is to pledge his uh, adherence to dialectical materialism. And second strategy uh, is uh, posing his, uh, the content of this text as a hypothesis, so using scientific language. Uh, and this hypothesis is a sort of cosmological hypothesis which links together the emergence on, of life and human intelligence on the Earth with entropic nature of material universe and uh, which is no less important, this historical achievement of communism. So these are three main uh, elements of this hypothesis. Emergence of uh, life, entropy, and uh, communism. So uh, first point uh, which he, with, with which he starts his uh, argument is uh, uh, literally, I quote, says, matter constantly, pos uh, he says, matter constantly possesses thought, constantly think itself, thinks itself. So matter thinks itself, but it's not a crazy idealist or animist uh, 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 statements that matter thinks. But he says, uh, 
uh, rather that uh, uh, matter sinks, but somehow in relation uh, to specific spots in the universe where uh, sinking life emerges, such as Earth, for example, but it could be other world. Uh, so matter sinks in, in not in terms of uh, have, uh, that matter has a, a sort of sinking or consciousness, like some of contemporary, by the way, new materialists arguing, like uh, Rosie Bright Doty, they're discussing sm smart matter or like matter which is so nice and smart that it can sink. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 but rather, so this is post Deleuze and uh, sort of rethinking vitalism uh, of Deleuze into sort of uh, thinking matter as well. But Ilyenko is very precise and conscious in using this term. So he says about <coughs> rather uh, that uh, matter thinks, but as a whole, as a substance, as infinite substance. Uh, so uh, as the universe is infinite by, by, by the law of probability, there will always be a form of life or another complex form of matter which is capable of thinking yeah, at some space and time. So for example, now it is Earth, it could be other spot, it could be other forms of life, and so on and so on. So, But because the universe is infinite, the probability of emergence of these forms uh, are almost 100 degree, 100 uh, percent. So, so, and uh, it's also important to comment here that uh, uh, <coughs> in, in Soviet or um, uh, in Soviet philosophy, official philosophy, um, uh, matter was understood as an ensemble of the uh, its form forms of movement. Uh, uh, like as ascending hierarchy of development from the lowest forms of matter which are covered by the realms explored by physics, chemistry, biology, to its highest forms which are the human brain and intelligence uh, that uh, shape also its social form of matter, like society is also social form of matter. Uh, and each uh, lower form supporting the emergence of the higher one and it is its function in the process. But the question is uh, here, uh, so what is about uh, the function of higher form of matter, such as uh, human intelligence uh, or brain? Because there is not higher form of matter above it. So this is an uh, opening question for the whole discourse of uh, cosmology. Uh, and also, uh, 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 this uh, this uh, mm, thinking about matter actually somehow mixed uh, has mixed combination of origins. First one is exactly Engels' dialectics of nature, where he discusses forms of matter, and also this Lenin uh, work uh, where he uh, polemicized with Bogdanov, uh, materialism and empirical criticism, that where Lenin stresses the forms of movement of matter. That matter is not static, uh, but it's in permanent dynamic process. So. Uh, 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 also, uh, so I'm uh, giving a comment on these uh, ideas of Ilyenkov in terms of how he understands this connection between matter and thought. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the more interesting point here is, uh, is that as the universe is infinite in space, its development paradoxically is already finished. Yeah? Uh, as everything already exists, uh, including highest form of intel intelligent life. Yeah? Of course, uh, dialectics and development does work, do work, uh, but in specific parts and fragments of the universe. So in specific areas of the universe, uh, sort uh, already emerged somewhere, it's not yet emerged in somewhere areas or sectors so the universe you can just have this sort of zero level degree and so on and so on and here is one of these nice commentators of Ilyenkov takes uh, stress uh, the, uh, here Ilyenkov very close to Spinoza if we take this sort of materialist interpretation of Spinoza uh, interpreting the infinite matter as a substance uh, in Spinoza language uh, which is eternal unchangeable if it is con considered as a totality. So in, in general, it's not changeable. And this is very nice comment uh, from uh, one of the authors who was writing on this question that cosmology somehow reflects uh, the Spinoza famous picture of the universe as a homeostasis which, was, uh, which is uh, as totality remains unchanged all, although all its constituent parts incessantly move like uh, pieces in kaleidoscope. 
So it's like a very complex combination of uh, uh, movement and uh, homeostasis. So in this sense, and paradoxically, Hegelian dialectics somehow included uh, in Spinoza, in Sp more broader Spinozian paradigm, and generally it's a big question and, uh, 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 about the relation between Hegel and Spinoza because usually they are opposed to each other. So, for example, in Antusarianism, uh, uh, you always decide Hegel or Spinoza. But uh, somehow, interestingly, Ilyenkov combines uh, the, the arguments or ontologies uh, in uh, this sort of combination. Uh, uh, so, uh, the substance... Uh, <laughs> as in Spinoza, possesses at least two attributes, thought and extension, this uh, dimension of expansion. And uh, if vulgar materialism, uh, argues Silenkov, says that thought emerged from a uh, dialectical movement of matter, so ma matter is necessary for emergence of thought. Uh, the existence of thought uh, itself, so, uh, uh, so matter is necessary, but thought is rather contingent, not necessary. It is like a... a product of, of fortuitous combination of circumstances, says Lienkov in the text. But in his version of materialism, he suggests that matter is somehow can, uh, cannot exist without thought. But again, it doesn't, doesn't mean that matter sinks. It's rather cannot exist without thought. And then after that claim, uh, Lienkov tries to prove it with his cosmological hypothesis. So uh, as I said, uh, according to uh, mm, uh, his understanding of uh, various forms of movement of matter, there is no form of matter above uh, in form, uh, which, uh, form of matter which is uh, human intelligence or brain or thinking brain, how, it's, how, it is, uh, how this is, uh, he calls it. And accordingly, the whole uh, movement or process of development of various forms of uh, matter is locked between these two threshold, the lowest one where you have this sort of zero uh, level of development and the highest one, which is uh, what he calls uh, uh, thinking brain or sort of the thinking matter, yes, because brain is matter, thinking matter as well. But he has a more complicated argument about the brain, thinking brain or thinking body. Uh, so all development, the development is somehow paradoxically locked between this threshold and it could be only cyclical, so it emerges from the zero degrees, then it achieves uh, uh, this level of uh, highest level. And then finally, universe somehow collapses or returns to the zero point. But the most interesting uh, the question is what happens between this uh, uh, highest point and uh, uh, this sort of um, returning to previous uh, si uh, to, to the, the lowest uh, cycle of uh, development. So here, uh, Ilyenkov uh, rather admits uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 this, the idea of limits of development, which is definitely, the, uh, however, he always says, no, it's dialectical materialism, it's de but it definitely was not so standard understanding of development. It was rather uh, pushing this uh, core philosophical statement to extreme than just a standard interpretation of dialectical materialism of this time. So, uh, uh, so uh, basically, he uh, he says that uh, mm, uh, how we can understand this cosmic situation of this uh, oscillation between low, lowest and highest, for, highest forms of development. So this is a cyclic, mo a cyclic movement of from lowest to forms of matter to the highest and back. Yeah? But what happens between them is a sort of uh, annihilation or a sort of decomposition of matter which somehow then uh, brings it back uh, to this sort of zero level. And how this, uh, uh, how this annihilation of matter happens, uh, here uh, he already implies uh, uh, these ideas about thermal death of the universe and uh, also uh, physical theories of Big Bang, or this sort of huge explosion which somehow relaunched the whole cycle of development of the universe. So, uh, mm, and uh, but specific point here is not uh, about this uh, Big Bang or uh, thermal death, but what happens with, uh, what is the function or role of human uh, intelligence uh, or post-human intelligence, whatever intelligence would be in this process. So Ilyenkov uh, here 
introduces this sort of what con constitutes a sort of uh, phantasmagoric element of his hypothesis. He, uh, he also somehow borrowing uh, inspiration, as I said, from uh, dialectics of nature by Engels. As you know, uh, paradoxically in this book, Engels also discusses the entropic death of the universe. So you can, can you expect this from an optimistic author of Communist Manifesto? He also thought about what happened in this distant future when even though we could probably achieve communism and so on. So Engels is an extremely interesting text, actually. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Engels also discussed uh, discuss the question of entropy in uh, this book, uh, referring to this uh, uh, German physicist, Rudolf Clausius, who already was mentioned here yesterday, I think. So, uh, so for Engels, it was rather open question. He had no answers. He, he, was, he knows just only miracle could uh, save <laughs> the world from growing entropy. And that's all, he says, in, uh, in, in, in Dialectics of Nature. And, and here, here enters in Ilyenkov, who actually, uh, uh, like a true Leninist, he thought that uh, it, here, at this point, it should be intervention uh, uh, to make things happen, to reverse the, the, the entropy. So in this sense, he is like very uh, faithful to Leninist politics of intervention. Yeah? So because he, he thinks that uh, 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 what should uh, uh, how how to move from this thermal death, which is like zero point, to a new cosmic explosion or rather Big Bang, uh, is uh, to actually to stage this explosion. So the function of humanity or, or this highest form of matter is actually to relaunch yeah, the universe <laughs> in a huge cosmic explosion. This is like most m most uh, mind blowing part of his uh, his this text <laughs> is that uh, um, that um, uh, somehow uh, and especially touching when he I will give just one quote not not to take a lot of time uh, and uh, especially touching then he used the expression like in concrete terms or in simple terms like discussing like what to do in the kitchen tomorrow or but this is in simple terms what he how he imagined this process of uh, cosmic explosion. So I quote, just give one quote. In concrete terms, one can imagine it like this. At some point of their development, thinking beings executing their cosmological duty and sacrificing themselves produce conscious cosmic catastrophe, provoking a process, uh, a reverse thermal dying of cosmic matter, that is, provoking a process leading to rebirth of dying worlds by means of a cosmic cloud of incandescent gas and vapors. He's very poetic and rhetorically, he was uh, actually a son of a writer, a very important Soviet writer, who he, he's usually could be very eloquent in he, what he's writing. In simple, ter in simple terms, he continues, in simple terms, uh, so, uh, so it turns out to be a necessary mediating link, uh, uh, thanks only to which the fiery rejuvenation of universal matter becomes possible. So here, through this event of self-destruction, so it proves its necessity. So it's not just a contingent outcome of this big ontological machine of the universe, it proves its own necessity. Yeah, by through this self-negating suicidal, suicidal gesture. Uh, this being said, he, he continue the quote, uh, uh, so it remains a historically transitional episode in development of the universe, a derivative, secondary uh, uh, product of the development of matter, but a product that is absolutely necessary, a consequence that simultaneously becomes the condition for existence of infinite matter. So it's quite high philosophical language. So basically he argues that in uh, this cosmological machine, uh, thought becomes necessary, not from the very beginning, not by some, I don't know, Spinoza, Spinoza put together matter and, and thought, but somehow through this event, which is very important element, which is not so, uh, rather not classical argument. So event which retroactively, uh, affirms uh, the necessity of thought as an attribute of matter. And attribute is a very important uh, 
Spinozian terms, so uh, Spinoza distinguished between attribute as necessary, qu necessary qualities of substance and, uh, 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 and its uh, secondary qualities or modes. So, so, uh, so thought is an attribute of matter. This is the simplest and shortest form of expression of this point. So it's necessary, necessary attribute of matter. Here, uh, uh, just to conclude about uh, Elienkov argument, uh, and he also, uh, uh, then after pr proposing this sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, explosion thing and uh, this uh, nice idea that uh, humanity should develop itself, develop its technical scientific forces to be able to, in the end, uh, to launch uh, the cosmic nuclear reaction <laughs> to uh, restart the universe uh, development, which was actually implied here, uh, is, is, uh, he says that uh, this hypothesis is at least uh, much more sober and uh, more, pr more and less idealistic than all this religious or uh, hypothesis or hypothesis of uh, idealistic philosophers. I don't know, like Hegel system, like acquiring absolute knowledge is a Whole, gay, uh, whole goal of development, or moral perfection, or whatever w w uh, we are suggested by various uh, forms of idealistic philosophy or religion. So this uh, he calls uh, those uh, system, uh, th those goals, pathetic fantasies. So he actually started that uh, uh, hum humbly qualifying his own hypothesis as phantasmagoria, but then he claims uh, that all other hypotheses are rather pathetic fantasies. So uh, the, the goal is real. His goal is not acquiring the, 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 the absolute knowledge or moral perfection, but uh, saving, the <laughs> saving the universe from its uh, thermal uh, collapse. Yeah? So this is, of course, you can say that it's like uh, also common with uh, Russian or but why not Albanian cosmos? I don't know Russian cosmos. Anyway, but, but uh, Russian uh, cosmos, uh, cosmos, we discussed uh, uh, the the sort of uh, central uh, role of human development in its sort of cosmological function. But for Lyenkov, it's not this like Fedorov. He doesn't propose you in immortal life. He vice versa. He 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 says that uh, you should uh, actually uh, take part in another common task. Yeah, <laughs> destroying yourself and uh, destroying the the uh, uh, the sort of dying universe. So it's like a very sacrificial. It's not like pro good good offer on the market of uh, you know a region like we give you immortality, be happy and, and you know all these things. So it's uh, here comes uh, this very important element, which is communism, which actually concentrates in itself all these meanings. Uh, because, uh, and in Ilyenkov text is actually is a sort of marginal line uh, of uh, description uh, of what he calls uh, cosmic hypothesis. Uh, he, uh, but uh, now it's very interesting because for Ilyenkov, he, until, un, until <coughs> end of 50s and maybe end of 60s, he believed that communism is uh, feasible. It could be global, uh, could be, but, but of course after 68, for example, many things happened, uh, this, this belief in the uh, capacity of Soviet system to expand or be convincing uh, in proposing this communist. Uh, society, of course, had many doubts, but in time he, when, when he wrote uh, this text, of course, he, he believed that communism is something by default. Uh, it's like, it's not tomorrow, but day after tomorrow, or something like this. And another quote very, very briefly, a million years will pass, thousands of generations will be born and go to their graves. A genuine human system will be established on the earth with uh, the conditions for uh, rich activity, such as classless society, material and uh, intellectual culture will abundantly blossom, he says. Uh, <coughs> and this will, be, this will be precondition for actually entering in the state when you are somehow preparing this cosmic explosion, developing all technical scientific <coughs> uh, capacities to the highest points. So, uh, and uh, I, I just keep some parts of the paper. How, how much time I actually have? 
Okay. So, uh, but this is most interesting because it's more about interpretation. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so of course, the question is how contemporary, presumably enlightened, uh, critical, or perhaps ironic reader can approach cosmological spirit. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Alienkov was aware that this text is a little bit too much, even uh, for. Uh, this more or less liberal post-Stalinist U USSR atmosphere of 50s. Uh, and that's why he, but he never rejected this text and he was sharing this text with some of his close friends of, uh, or students and so on and so on. Uh, about interpretation of cosmology, of course the first, uh, so interpretation would be identifying this mythic content uh, in the, the, as I said about mythology and Aristotle, uh, that this mythic content is very important. Here, of course, it's like uh, maybe returning to this pre-modern uh, uh, contents which could be somehow wrapped into the language of classical philosophy, science, dialectical materialism. Of course, uh, this heroic self-sacrifice, sacrifice, global fire, a sort of Promethean motive and so on. And I, I can't resist uh, to quoting because uh, I, I sent this text to Boris Groys, and he actually suggested even more radical hypothesis that its uh, text is a revival of Aztec religion because of uh, because of uh, a sort of uh, uh, mythical figure of God who somehow sacrificed himself to prevent a collapse of, of the, the universe. So I think Ilyenkov uh, would be probably happy to... Uh, have a good philosophical laughter about this and so on, and he, I think, would be uh, self-aware that these uh, claims of this uh, text, which is like 40 pages short treaty, is a little bit <coughs> enormous. You know? So he would be definitely agree on maybe on this, reading this layer of this text. Uh, and uh, also, as I said, this text could be read if it tackles the topic of mythology. We could read this as a sort of uh, the mythology of reason, because if to use it, uh, the term which was used uh, in uh, late 18th century in all the systematic program of German idealism, presumably written by Hegel, Schelling, and Hölderlin, they had the idea of mythology of reason, which means that the content, very sophisticated content of uh, philosophy can be somehow delivered in a way of sensory images and narratives, which would be sort of more democratically and ad addressed directly to the masses, which probably were not aware about subtle subtleties of German idealist philosophy. So in this sense, you could say, indeed, it has a sort of mythic element in this text, but this is rather mythology of reason in this sense, a mythology which tries to deliver <coughs> in a dramatic narrative condensed meaning of communist project. Uh, another uh, reading of this text uh, would be somehow reductive, so we could relate it uh, to Ilyenkov's uh, own suicide as also as a sort of primordial suicidal fantasy, or you can read this a social political symptom which was generated by this sort of short-lived gap between uh, post-Stalinist moment and disenchantment of late socialism. So this gap is somehow uh, was full with social optimism uh, backed by real position of the USSR after the Second World War as a sort of global superpower and uh, somehow was uh, edged with melancholy with, that lived by the feeling of transience and fragility of real communism. And it can be probably said that somehow Ilyenko prefigures uh, uh, future collapse as a sort of cosmic catastrophe. But this would be sort of sociological or psycho uh, psychological reading of the text. I think there are, could be more interesting ways of approaching this text uh, as well. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, uh, this could be said about, uh, this, uh, we can discuss as not as a uh, related to historical episode of uh, historical episode of the 20th century, but for example, the experience of this whole communist project as a whole, because for example, uh, mm, uh, I always like to quote this uh, seminal book by 
sorry, again, for, by, by Boris Groys, uh, cosmo, uh, the communist postscript, which somehow discuss uh, the communism, uh, so, uh, even its uh, version of Soviet version of real, uh, version of real uh, communism, as a sort of linguistic being, where language was somehow detached from the forces of market, from its instrumentalization, which opened enormous speculative field for philosophy. And the Lienkov text could be read as a sort of another paradox or a paradoxical speculative outcome of this field of thinking which was opened by the Soviet Union, which was somehow detached from material concerns of market economy. You know? Or as my friend uh, Artemi Magun argues, uh, 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 this could be also related to the question of negativity embedded in communism, uh, because uh, usually we pre uh, pre uh, usually we think about communism as a nice sweet utopia, uh, ideal, uh, I don't know, uh, ide idealized uh, without internal contradiction, but uh, vice versa, probably co communism could be read as experience of radical negativity, which somehow provokes uh, this sort of speculative thinking about communism as a specific social form of destruction of the universe in specific uh, episode of its development, which could lead uh, to another cycle. And that's why it's necessary. And uh, this is uh, actually also could be a hypothesis about this text, which uh, uh, opens a whole chain of thoughts here. Uh, and for example, some of these first dissidents, uh, uh, they were arguing, uh, reading Ilyenkov cosmology, look, what communism leads us, it's just the idea to destroy the humanity, you know, <laughs> what is a specific uh, idea, uh, it's just uh, negation, yeah? Yeah, but still uh, another, another way of approaching this uh, also would be to put this context uh, text in the context of contemporary uh, debates. Uh, I know, if you want, I, I have two more interpretations. So if you, <laughs> <laughs> so first one, very briefly, uh, uh, w first one is rather Foucauldian interpretation, inter uh, considering this text as a sort of uh, exercise uh, in building communist subjects. So you know, according to late Foucault, uh, uh, and such call as uh, Pierre Hadot, uh, physics uh, and uh, this sort of ontology can have a political and ethical function. For example, for the Stoics, uh, physics and cosmology was not only form of knowledge or discourse, but say they used it as a meditative, a meditative exercise. So to detach subject from his or her immediate narrow environment and ascend to the whole of the world which makes everyday passions or affect in, in affects insignificant. In this sense, cosmology could be read as an exercise in building of communist su subject as well, uh, because uh, uh, it, what uh, yesterday it was uh, mentioned, this sort of conversion or metanoia thing, uh, effects, and definitely, uh, this uh, meditation about transience, about all things in the world, including the most valuable things such as communism and the very existence of humanity. So it, even after collapse of real, uh, so even it, this text would be published, I think, in Soviet time, it would be a very good exercise to think about uh, transience of communism and humanity itself. Uh, so, uh, and especially in our time, when you are reading this text, uh, you, you get somehow reconciled and passive uh, somehow, I don't know, uh, especially given our contemporary situation of this sort of mixture of neoliberalism, neoimperialism, neo-nationalism, neo quite miserable political predicament, and when you read such texts, it definitely gi gives you calming and invigorating effect, yeah? Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, what else I was, uh, I was, yeah. I don't know, but the other way because because I actually didn't reach uh, didn't reach uh, the more contemporary things. I was trying to uh, compare. I was thinking to compare uh, Ilyenkov ontology with Badiusian reading of Spinoza, but maybe it would be, <laughs> <because> <laughs> 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 and uh, and also use it, it as a good. tool of critique of uh, Quentin Mesus. Uh, um, yeah, but I think it's a little. It's, I hope it might be published.